Uh, beyond tapping mode, the basics of the advanced engine modes. Uh, this is what this is about. Tapping mode, we all know tapping mode. There are two different basic imaging modes. There are contact mode and a tapping mode. In tapping mode, the tip is basically oscillating and then interact with the sample and then obtain the topographical image. But there are a lot of advanced imaging modes that P can, can be uh, derived from the tapping mode. And then we're just going to talk about this uh, advanced imaging modes that is available for uh, tapping modes uh, uh, controllers. So we're going to cover a little bit about basics of tapping mode. And then uh, after that, we'll talk about the long range force interactions and then basic AF modulations, these three topics. I will emphasize on number two, long range force interactions. So basic force interactions of tapping mode is a tip and a sample. And when the tip is approaching the sample at a certain distance, the, the uh, molecules at the end of the tip and then the molecules on the sample will experience, start with attractive force when this distance is around 10 nanometers. Then as the tip getting very close to the sample or invade the sample space, then the attractive force turns into repulsive force. We have been talking about this in the past. The attractive force is the van der Waals force. The range is very short, about 10 nanometers. And then the uh, repulsive force is basically the when tip of sample distance is uh, uh, below nanometer, below zero, basically they're invading each other and then become repulsive force. That's the basics of tapping mode, the force interaction. Okay. So um, close range force. So tapping mode is based on close range force, basically, basically of the repulsive force. That's because you cannot put two subject uh, to matter into the same space and they started to uh, repulse each other. That's the basics of the, the tapping. You had to start to tap each other, tip and sample start to repulse each other. Okay, so here is some drawings, simplification drawings of tip sample interaction. Uh, let's ignore all these complicated things. You focus on the red line. You have attractive force and then repulsive force, attractive and repulsive, and that's it, attractive and repulsive. And this attractive and repulsive cause a big shift of the cantilever's uh, oscillation resonance. And then when tip sample get to repulsive, the some of the energy of the vibration also been damped by the surface, which caused the the the, the uh, big reduction of the uh, vibration. Basically, the surface does not allow the tip to vibrate uh, anymore because the surface basically uh, repels the tip. So those are short range force, right? We use this to uh, to do tapping mode. Now, advanced imaging mode, uh, when we say advanced imaging mode, we'll talk about the MFM, EFM, KF, and so on and so forth. They're based on the long range force that can be imaged with, with AFM uh, instrument. So what is a long range force, right? Long range force, uh, here, here we're gonna talk about the magnetic force or electrical static force. And when we say long range, it is beyond the Van der Waals force interaction distance, for example, beyond 10 nanometers, all the way to several microns. And then if we talk about the magnetic force, magnetic force can reach up to a couple of millimeters and even longer. Okay, so that's long range. That's what we mean by long range. Electric steady force is also long range, right? You have something electrically charged and then you can generate attractive force, reach out quite long distance. So that's long range. And in AFM sense, this long range force are any force that's beyond 10 nanometer, where tip and sample is no longer in the tapping range, no longer they actually tap each other. That's what we mean by long range force. So let's go back, still go back to the tip sample interaction. And here, assume this dotted line is the turning point from attractive to repulsive. And then we know we assume it's typically a nanometer to 10 nanometers. Uh, the exact distance of this short and long is actually depends on the sample. Some of the sample, for example, a silicon surface uh, or a uh, protein, they're quite short range. The, this is about a nanometer or so. Beyond nanometer, the, long, the short range force just disappeared. But for some samples like polymer, uh, because of its strong charge, 
this distance is a bit longer, but that's a different topic. Okay. So the negative force gradient caused the resonant frequency shift and positive force gradient caused the resonant frequency shift either ways. Now, other than this short range force, uh, we would just say that there's some long range force too here. We overlap some long range force gradient. In this case, for example, magnetic force, right? It's just force because atomic force microscope, the tip will sense the force and where does the force come from? And that's uh, um, is a different matter. It could be a magnetic force, it could be electrical static force, but it is long range force. It's a force that's beyond 10 nanometer, all the way to a couple of microns, okay? So suppose the tip is approaching this sample, right? So for example, I mean, I put the little bit of stone here and you have a tip right here. And then this tip sample distance is within, let's say a nanometer to 10 nanometers. So the tip is oscillating at that short range force region. And then the resonant frequency of the tip will be influenced by this short range force. And that is what we call it the tapping mode and non-counter mode. This, this force allow you to, uh, allow the tip to interact with the sample and then obtain topography message because this short range force is very short distance. And then the track of the, this force allow the tip to track the surface topography up to nanometers or even sharper. Okay, so that's short range force. What if I lift the tip a little bit and let the tip have a separation distance to the sample? The separation is, is higher than 10 nanometers. So tip and sample is no longer in, interact with each other with short range force. So they don't feel each other. They don't touch each other anymore. And then when you oscillate the tip at that long range distance, then this force gradient, these red lines will also impact the resonant frequency because you know it's a force gradient and tip is a, uh, the, the uh, effective spring constant of the tip will be shifted by this long range force gradient. And therefore the uh, resonant frequency will equally shift, okay? So when the resonant frequency shift, uh, the amplitude will shift a little bit, but not a lot. However, the phase, the phase gradient, phase uh, of this tip oscillation will shift much, much bigger. And then, you know, AFM can collect, AFM basically has a uh, locking amplifier built in to do tapping mode. And if you separate the tip sample distance at this long range, and then you just scan the tip over the sample at this separation distance, and then we record the phase gradients. And this phase gradients will show you the attractive or repulsive force gradient between tip and sample. And therefore using this principle, we could map out the uh, advanced imaging mode uh, magnetic force or static electrical force, electrical static force. And that's the basics of the uh, advanced imaging modes, basically imaging the phase shift. Okay, magnetic force microscopy, MFM. And this is how MFM works that the tip will, tip will scan on the sample, Cantor will measure the surface topography on the first scan, it will scan over the sample first. And when tip and sample scan on the sample first, uh, the, uh, the strong force, the Van der Waals force will interact with the tip and then this tapping mode called, called tapping mode based uh, feedback will cause the tip to uh, keep track of the surface topography and you plot the surface topography line out, you get topography image. That's the first scan. And after that, the tip will lift over the sample. It basically, it will, it, it will remember the uh, scan of the first line and add a separation distance. And this is called the lift, lift mode. Lift, it lifts a certain distance. Typically, about 50 nanometers, sometimes 100 nanometers of lifting. And if the sample is extremely smooth, you could also lift a shorter distance. If the sample is very rough, you need to lift a higher distance because uh, if you lift a shorter distance, the tip will collide with the sample when, and then you actually mix your MFM image with your topography image. And then this uh, MF image no longer look nice and then only MFM, it's mixed. So, this tip will scan over the sample the first time and then feed back to it and collect topography. And then at the second scan, 
the tempo lift at a separation distance with a height difference, and then scan over the sample and then record the uh, uh, face imaging, face uh, shift of this, this sample. When you do that, the face shift of the sample uh, basically represents the magnetic field. Of course, I mean, tip and sample has to have a magnetic force. Uh, so the tip has to have a coating of magnetic material, cobalt typically, some other magnetic material. So the tip itself is a magnet. And then when you tip, lift the tip and sample so with a separation distance, uh, this, uh, this magnetic field between the sample and the tip uh, will uh, show some attractive repulsive force which is magnetic force. And then this force caused the uh, phase to shift. And you record a phase that is the magnetic field reading of your sample. That's the basics of the magnetic force microscopy, magnetic force imaging. Here are some examples of it. The image on the upper left are uh, basically uh, the magnetic readings on hard drive. So this is a basically zero and one on hard drive. And then you can see that uh, you can see the, the uh, attractive region, the repulsive region easily. The one on the right is uh, another such uh, micro nano magnets. These little bits are magnets. These little magnets are actually um, the magnified. On one side is north, the other side is south. And you can see the, the dark side and bright side. Bright side represents repulsive force, and then dark side represents the attractive magnetic force. And then you can see this on the upper left corner, this little magnet is reversed compared to the other. So there are tiny little magnets. The magnetic force microscopy. Okay. Um, remember this, uh, when you use MFM tip to image your magnetic sample, your tip is coated with magnetic material, uh, hard bacterial material. And you need to, uh, if, you, if you want to increase the interaction efficiency, you should uh, magnetize your tip basically by uh, approach your tip very close to a very strong magnet, mag magnet, magnetize it, and then using the same tip to image and your MF image will have a good effect. Okay. Uh, here's some more examples of it on the upper left corner. Basically, this is uh, stainless steel, and then we know stainless steel is an alloy, and uh, it's alloy made of uh, domains of cobalt, iron, and so on and so forth. And different uh, magnet domains will show this different kind of magnet pattern. And this image on the left is a topography image that's obtained by the first scan. And then the magnetic domain image is the phase shift obtained using the second scan. The one on the lower, uh, it's, a, it's a different sample with little, with little tiny magnets. Okay, so it's MFM. Uh, the long range, force, long range force imaging of the AFM can also scan and sense the tip's electrical static force. And then we call it electrical force microscopy or electrical force imaging, EFM. There are many different ways of image EFM. Uh, we're going to categorize them as interleave EFM with DC bias, EFM with AC bias, and then you can also do uh, scanning surface potential image. And scanning surface potential is no longer called EFM; it's called Kelvin force microscopy. And then you could use multiple locking technology to do EFM imaging as well. Uh, this shows you the basics of uh, we call the uh, uh, DC or AC and the one on the left tip bias DC. So the, here's how it works. So in order to image the surface charge, that's a little Chinese word you'll find it says charge, again for charge, you have charges on the surface. And how do you image its charge? Okay, the way to image its charge is that um, um, is, is that you have to um, have a, the tip to sense the attractive repulsive force. So you have to generate some kind of force between the tip and sample. How do you do that? You should charge the tip too, right? You should apply the bias voltage to the tip. And if, if the tip has charged with a DC bias, then this, this charge causes long range electrostatic force 
and then you do the same lift mode with scan, second scan, and then this second scan, the face imaging of the second scan can actually sense the electrical charge and so on. That will, that's what we call the DC biased uh, EFM. Basically, uh, we're imaging the charge between tip and sample by generate, uh, generate static force. Now, people in, in electrical engineer field, or anyone has experience of electrical engineer, we know that every signal has noise. And then this uh, electrical static charge is actually very small. Uh, if your surface charge is not very strong, this force is very small. And the tip, when it's exposed to the air, it also has a lot of its own intrinsic noise. We call it a browning motion. The tip will oscillate even without uh, any force attached to it. Basically, the tip, it's thermal, thermal noise. And this thermal noise compared to your electrical static force, if it is very big, then this EFM does not work. It does not give you a good signal or you got the noise. Now, in the electrical engineer field, we know that it is uh, kind of difficult to detect a DC voltage because, because of this noise. And if you have noise, which is one volt, your signal is 0 0.01 volt, very, very difficult to uh, detect. However, if this signal is an AC signal with a known frequency, it's much easier. You could use a technology called locking amplifier. You log on to lock on a particular frequency. And you can pick up signal one out of a million. Basically, you can have one part of signal and a million part of noise. You can pick up that signal using this tuning. And, and this is nothing strange. And we all know that in early uh, radios, right? That uh, in, when I was a kid, we listened to radios. And then basically, the, the, the air is full of noise. But if I tune to a particular frequency, and I can pick up the frequency out of lots of noise. And this is the basics of the AC biased EFM. Basically, I will apply an AC uh, signal to the tip and cause the tip to oscillate up and down. And we could detect that as oscillation caused by tip. And that is the AC, AC uh, based the, the, the one. This picture is still the DC biased, right? You scan the sample twice, DC biased, and detect the attractive positive force. And then this is the slide for the AC bias. It basically, you, you scan the tip on a sample with tapping mode the first time, okay? And then you lift the tip and you switch the drive from the piezo to the bias tip. So that when you lift, the piezo no longer oscillate. The tip is gliding over the surface with no oscillation, but you, you apply an AC voltage to the tip, the bias. This AC, voltage will cause the attractive, will cause the electrical static force to cycle up and down at that frequency. And you detect that vibration. And then this signal is your EFM signal. It's much more sensitive. Okay. So you, this is the basics of the KFM. Uh, I'm gonna jump over this. This is a little bit too complicated. I'm gonna go to the single pass EFM KFM with double locking first, and then we go back to KFM. So the, um, this, here, this EFM, basically you use, uh, you, you use a lift mode, basically the tip is scanned on the sample twice. The first time is on the sample. The second time it was lifting distance. That's because you want to separate the tapping force from the electrical static force by separate two separate scans. But you could also scan, in a, you can detect both signal on a single scan. Basically, you could apply tapping on a piezo and apply electrical static, electrical bias to the tip at the same time, but at different frequency. So basically, you, you can separate frequency and detect the, the surface topography and the electrical state force at the same time. We call a single scan with, with double locking, two lockings. So again, you scan it and piezo driving on one frequency and then the tip bias on a separate frequency. This way you can have the EFM to be detected while the tip is scanning on the topography at the exact same scan, single pass. It gives you better resolution too. Okay. I'll move on to the next advanced topic, which is the Kelvin Force microscopy. So here we're gonna do a little bit of math here. Suppose I have a tip. I have a sample, 
apply a, a ACDC voltage to tip. And this first formula describes you the force between the tip and sample. And then you add the uh, cycle, the, the sine omega t, which is the oscillation part, to the, uh, uh, the phi square, which is the, the voltage difference between the, the uh, potential difference between tip and sample. Now you have two, uh, three phases, one, two, three. First is the phi, which is the, it's a DC part, so it does not cause tip to vibrate. And you have UDC and then UAC and sine omega t. So you separate these part into, into uh, two part. You have this first part and second part. And then in conclusion, I mean, this, there's some mathematics. I'm not going into the details that in conclusion is that the force between tip and sample is determined by two factors. One is the, the DC voltage difference between tip and sample, which is phi mi uh, minus U or DC. And then it also depends on the time effect. Okay. So in other words, if the DC part of the tip equals to the AC, a DC part of the sample, when the phi is equal to UDC, when that happens, uh, your, your force, the Kelvin force is actually dropped to zero. Even you have an AC part on the tip, this force is still dropped to zero. Okay, that gives us a very interesting tool. That's because that if I use a feedback loop and I will manipulate the UDC, the DC component of the tip, manipulate so that the oscillation, this F omega, F omega this oscillation, so this oscillation is clear to zero, to zero light, not a phi. When that happens, the DC voltage I put on the tip, when I put that, that equals the DC voltage on the sample. In other words, I'm measuring the DC voltage on the sample. I'll put this channel, I can measure the surface potential. And that is the basics of the Kelvin force microscopy, is that by nullify this Kelvin force, I'm measuring the potential on the sample. That's what this is. Okay, here it is. At oops. apply voltage, and then we call the force. When this force is to uh, approach to zero, that's when the output of the UDC, the DC part of the tip bias, and then that output call, uh, image is your Kelvin force microscopy. Okay, so we have a second turn here. And if you look at this, then there's another is the there's another force which is uh, at a double omega, two omega t. In other words, if we log on the second harmonics of this oscillation, you actually, you can detect the DCDZ, which is the capacitive gradients. So here's a little explanation of it. So when I apply a, a voltage to the tip, up and down, up and down, if the, the, the surface charge will cause a force that's up and down, up and down. However, if I nullify this DC force, okay, so the, the potential of the tip and sample is the same. The tip can also, this, the charge on the tip can also cause the polarization on the sample. The tip will polarize the sample because there is a charge on the tip, okay? So when you polarize the sample, what happened is that when the tip is positive, it caused the sample to be polarized to negative up, positive down. When tip potential reach a negative peak here, it will flip the polarization on the sample. So at the positive side cycle and negative side in both cycle, the tip and sample force is all turn into attractive. In other words, in one cycle up and down, one period, um, the, the, the force between tip and sample actually peak twice. In other words, the tip will sense a attractive force at double the frequency. And this attractive double frequency is proportional to the CDZ signal. In other words, if I output with this double frequency signal oscillation of the tip, I'm measuring the DCDZ signal. So that's a byproduct of Kelvin force microscopy, which is the measurement of the, the capacitance gradient DCDZ. Uh, this is the um, wiring or, or the, the signal process of the, uh, what do we call the multiple lock-in uh, single pass. You have one, two, three, three lock amplifiers. The first lock amplifier 
does the topography, the second lock amplifier uh, applied to the bias voltage, and then with a feedback loop, it output a Kelvin force microscopy, and you can have the third lock amplifier lock on double frequency, which obtained the DC DC signal. And here's some just some basic results. And uh, this is these are kind of interesting. The carbon nanotubes grow on silicon. And then basically the surface of silicon is patterned with a catalyst. So these nanotubes actually are brushes. They're standing up. And from here, you can also see some nanotubes are lying down. And then the here, the topography showed as 3D rendering. And the color on the right image shows the, the surface charge, which means that the, um, the this carbon nanotubes on the surface of silicon, they have about 500, 500 micro, uh, millivolts of charge. Um, this is a little bit advanced topics that you could also uh, not only detect the signal, but as you could also detect the primary resonant frequency shifting. I will not go into too much detail in it. Uh, the conclusion is that by log on to the phase shift of the primary resonant frequency, you could actually increase your resolution and decrease the noise I think about 10, 10 times, sometimes five, five to 10 times, yes, which allow you to detect very, very small signals and very small signals, and then further improve, increase your resolution. Uh, here's some examples of, this is a uh, perfluorine al alkane self-example on the surface. These little flowers are perfluorine alkane. Basically their carbon chain was a fluorine on one end. Um, uh, the, the, the hydrogen is replaced by fluorine, and therefore, because fluorine is you know, highly negative, electrical negative, they attract electron to them. So it caused the electrons in the silicon wafer to be attracted near this. And therefore, the, the two images on below is your surface potential, which shows the patches of negative charge that's caused by pulse fluorine alkane. The image on the left using the normal double, um, double locking and uh, single pass. The one on the right uses the frequency modulated KFM. Uh, this is an example of using the Kelvin force microscopy to image this uh, graphene sample. And the, uh, the polarization signal is on upper right corner and then basically shows the differentiation of single layer or multiple layers of graphene. And uh, we're gonna go to this more advanced imaging mode probably in the next presentation. And this this time we try to cut, don't try to, to make it go too long. We'll cover this later. And this is the image of the silver nanoparticles. And again, we use DCDD signal to detect the metal particles. And these metal type particles appear to have higher capacitance. And then this shows slightly more bright. Um, one more topics of an advanced imaging mode, we call this uh, sample modulation. Uh, so I was given a sample with uh, magnetic nanoparticles that's embedded in some other materials. And then we want to visualize the magnetic nanoparticles. And these particles are not big enough to generate enough magnetic field. So how do we do that? So we basically put a magnetic uh, coil here. And for someone who owns a Agilent atomic force microscope, you can just use the Magamo sample plate. Then you can apply a strong uh, magnetic oscillation, AC current on the magnetic coil, cause the sample cause the sample magnetic particle to oscillate, and you scan it with uh, contact mode. Don't scan with tapping mode. Scan with contact mode. The tip actually can sense the vibration caused by this magnetic modulation, and this is called magnetic sample modulation. And not only the the uh, Ferro-oxide sample can show the signal, and even uh, ferritin can show a very strong magnetic response because ferritin has uh, iron in its core. So that's kind of interesting way of using the existing instrument and invent something new, which is recorded here, magnetic, magnetic sample modulation. And here's, yeah, this is the magnetic uh, sample coil. And then, is the result of uh, ferron oxide. And the image on the upper right is the MSM face image. And you can see the, uh, ma ma those magnetic uh, part nanoparticles being oscillated by this coil. 
And here are the ferritin samples can also have very strong magnetic uh, response. Kind of interesting to observe. Um, so, okay, that is all for today. And before I'll ask you, that you before you can ask a question, uh, I have some good news to tell you. Uh, so this presentation actually attracted quite a, some attention from the community. And uh, we have uh, Sergey Kalini, Igor Sokolov, and they said, oh, I, I, I like to give a talk to your, uh, to your uh, Zoom FM too. And say, oh, that's great, I'll arrange for you. So Sergey and Igor, uh, they will both uh, volunteer to give a presentation in the future. So do turn back in, and Sergey is a very big um, uh, uh, name in the AFM field. And he liked to talk something about the uh, maybe scanning piezo microscopy and Igor Sokolov invent something about mechanical property imaging. And uh, Greg Halstead also, I, I'm working with him to see if he could contribute a talk and even a couple of talks. And then James Patiz, who's the chair and dean of Texas AM. And he's also a big name in AFM and STM. And if he could give a talk, that'd be great. I'm sure he would agree to it. So I put him picture here anyways. And uh, I want to confer with him. So do turn back and uh, we are attracting a lot of attention uh, now. Anyways, and thank you for your time. And if you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask. And then you can also type your question on the chat and I can read about it and answer you. Thank you for your time. Um, San, San, and this is Heidi. And a, a quick question here. Um, each time when you talk about um, MFM and EFM, uh, you mentioned two scan. The first scan is uh, topography, um, either tapping or contact mode there. Um, it, the purpose of the first scan, is it just to get the, the feel of the topography or there's other um reasons that you want that first scan there's no particular reason you can perfectly scan the tip over the sample with nothing of the first scan at all you can perfectly do that and if there's a magnetic force you can detect the phase shift i've done that it just scan just scan and then as you scan you approach the sample to the tip and then the mfn shop right away and it's a lot of fun to do that's because uh, because your tip is not scanning on a sample, it's just gliding over it, right? So you can scan real fast. You can scan as fast as 40 lines per second, very fast. You could do that, uh, totally, yes. As long as tip and sample is in range, you can sense the magnetic field. However, uh, because you are not, tip is not scanning on a sample, so tip does not know, the system does not know where the sample is, right? So in other words, uh, you, you actually don't know what the separation distance between tip and sample. And you don't even know if the sample is tilted. So, so as you approach, you're going to notice some of the sample will collide with the tip. So the, the, you will see a perfect MFM image, and then some of the points, there's, suddenly there's a dark shadow. Okay, that's, that's your tip collided with some mountains on the sample. So yes, you can do that. Now, when you do lift mode, the tip scan the sample first time will track the sample topography. And second time, it will remember this topography and then add a separation distance. In other words, the tip will automatically lift and avoid those mountains to maintain a strict uh, separation distance. And that's the purpose of lift, lift mode is for the tip to remember the sample shape and then uh, discount that shape when you cause the lift and maintain a constant lift distance. Okay, thank you. Uh, one quick uh, thing to mention is that uh, all these lift modes will also decrease your your resolution of, of the uh, of the sense of either magnetic field or electric field. So the you're better off actually running in, in a in a uh, tapping mode close to the surface in the either a single pass. You can do a single pass uh, MFM too. It's a little different because you have to adjust the uh, frequency to get the phase the right 
the right spot, but it's doable. Yeah, that's a very interesting. Yes, uh, uh, if, if you want to push the resolution to uh, very small magnetic domains, yes, you have to close the distance. The account of conflicting part is if the sample is very rough, then this closing of distance is limited by the roughness, so that to, you have to have a you know kind of balance. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can actually push the uh, electrostatic, the KFM measurements. Uh, um, oh, what is it? About uh, three years ago, we were able to push the uh, uh, the FM KFM measurements down to one nanometer uh, resolution um, using this technique, uh, the FM KFM technique. Um, so. Yeah, if you're if you go in with a small amplitude, so you're very close to the surface, and you uh, and you're running uh, with a, a single pass technique where you're measuring it uh, with very small amplitudes, you can get a, a very good resolution. I mean, better than I, we we're really at about the limit at one nanometer resolution, but we we're able. This is sort of Raleigh criterion, sort of measuring the differences between these floral alkene. Um, uh, uh, self assemblies on uh, on silicon. Yeah, what John is talking about is that using the um, multiple lock amplifier and single pass, you actually image the electrostatic force with no separation. There could be no separation at all. It's it's extremely small. And when you use a very small amplitude and using frequency modulation. Uh, the K KFM resolution is approaching a single molecular resolution. We can actually see a one pore about five nanometers, one to five nanometers of XY resolution. And uh, it just pushed limit to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 